Story time with Stephanie. I'm art historical novelist Stephanie Story. And I think about these kinds of issues about how to make art history relevant to today's audiences a lot because I write art history fiction primarily so far about white dudes from 500 years ago. So I so appreciate you guys being here. To start, I'm going to introduce my panel very quickly. Um, Bailey Woodley, wave Bailey Woodley. Uh, she's Hi. coming to us uh, from London and uh, she is, oh wait, this is her, this is her, her description of herself, uh, which I love, queer art historian, drag lust performer and glitter enthusiast. Uh, which may be my favorite part of the Twitter description. The current curator of queer art history and is currently getting her PhD. Uh, welcome, 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 Bailey Woodley. Thank you. Um, and then also the curator and host of Art and Color, which is a YouTube channel dedicated to highlighting the works of contemporary artists of color. She's now also getting her PhD in art history. I'm with a whole lot of smart people, which is so great. Uh, welcome uh, to this, this is the conversation, Jalen Walls. Hello, glad to be here. And finally, uh, my fellow art historical novelist, uh, who is the author of best-selling novels like The Painter's Apprentice, The Night Portrait, and The Stolen Lady, which just came out on September 20, 21st. There it is. It's about the Mona Lisa, so you know I geeked out over it. It's fantastic. Read it. The only one up here with her currently her PhD. Welcome, Laura Morelli. Hi, thank you so much. I'm very much looking forward to this conversation. So to start, we're all obviously art and art history geeks, right? We love this stuff. One of you already has a PhD of it. Two of you are getting your PhD in something like it. I already dropped out of my PhD program. As I told you before this thing started, we all spend our lives in some way or another dedicated to art and art history. So where on earth did your love of this come from? Uh, Laura Morelli, I'll start with you. Okay, thank you. Basically, uh, my love of art history started as a young age um, from travel. And um, when I was traveling overseas as a very naive young girl from a, a farm in Georgia, I realized that there was a whole world out there um, and a whole past that I, we didn't see here in America. And um, I realized that we were connected to people from, from centuries and centuries ago who had built these amazing cathedrals and these incredible buildings and who had painted amazing por portraits and pictures and made sculptures. And um, I just felt really connected to the long span of history. And I think at a young age, I realized that art history was really about stories and people. And I still feel that that is really at the root of art history. And I still think that it is the most fascinating topic in the world. I, I finished my studies uh, longer, longer ago than I want to admit, but I still think it's the most interesting topic in the whole world. Uh, there's never a, um, an exhaustion of topics to delve into. Uh, Jalen, what about you? Why do you love this stuff? Sure. So I basically started out uh, doing a lot of writing in high school. I thought I was going to be a, you know, a writer, uh, you know, like writing uh, screenplays, things like that. Um, and a teen council, which is like a group of teenagers at a museum. Uh, there are several different programs across the country. Uh, in my city was asking uh, for a writer for their Tumblr blog. And I was like, great, I'll write for the little museum blog. This will be a good experience. Um, but then I ended up meeting all these curators and writers. Um, and we were curating an exhibit on uh, black performance artists and I completely fell in love um, with the idea of not only talking about art, writing about art, but also just exploring the artist intent and the ability to share something about themselves through a creative medium. Uh, so that's basically where it all started and then it really spiraled out of control and I just kept working at museums and kept studying art and now I'm in a PhD program. So. Uh, Bailey, what about you? Uh, I'd always loved history, so I knew that was what I wanted to do. But then when I realized you could study the history of visual culture, there was sort of no going back for me. I think that I love it because visual culture is one of the most influential, and I think always has been one of the most influential ways that we communicate ideologies and ideas. But it's also, I think, the most underrated. You know, art history and the arts are often, especially 
in our society right now set aside. And so I think I love that art history gave me the tools to sort of interrogate that and ask questions about the ideologies that were being perpetuated that way. So now I understand why, why we're all sort of in this game and why we care. My other question is though, why does it matter? Like I really do face um, a lot of readers who show up at book clubs, particularly readers of book clubs where like there's one arty person who brings my book in and goes, great, we're gonna read this book. And there's like some science person or some accountant person who goes, oh, art history. It's just intimidating. I don't get it. It doesn't relate to my life. It is about 500 year old white dudes. So why, um, why should people today care about distant art history? Like, do you know what I mean? Uh, let's start with Jalen this time. Sure, so I don't necessarily um, know how to answer about distant art history because I do focus on contemporary art, but maybe an answer about why people should care about art um, yes. is that yeah. <laughs> I think art is something that belongs to the people. Um, I think several artists in their practice are attempting to say something about the human experience, whether it's their experience specifically or broader notions of um, culture, race, politics, society. Um, I'm not saying everything is so didactic, but oftentimes um, it is fun to understand what a specific person was experiencing throughout history or even in contemporary context um, and share that with other people in like a creative and visually stimulating way. Um, so I think that's why people should care because you're a person, you should know something about the people that came before you and it doesn't always have to be in a history textbook or in a journal, so that's all. So Bailey, from your perspective, what do you have to add to that? Or, or, or what's your perspective on why this stuff matters? I'm holding this up because I've had a genuine technical issue. So for the people that are watching, they're just listening and tuning into a weird version of our Zoom meeting. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, so for me, I think it's that a lot of our social systems and systems of representation have roots in the past, but also today, you know, people are using history to justify themselves all of the time, I think in the last, couple of years, white supremacist groups have been a really good example. They're taking medieval iconography and using it to sort of justify their cause. And if there aren't people to look back and say, you know, you're telling lies about history and to call them out on it and sort of reclaim art history for the people who need it, I think that um, th people can get away with things, I think quite dangerously. So I think that an awareness of where we come from is, is really important. And yeah, I mean, the fact is, it's just that, you know, art history was not white, but that's a narrative that's being created alongside the one that art history is straight. So I think that's very important. Right, art, art history was not actually white and straight, but it's so perceived to be all the time. You know, I, wh one of my favorite artists of all time, right, is um, Edmona Lewis. She's a, she's a sculptor, American. She spent a lot of time in Italy. She's half black, she's half Chippewa. She's brilliant, right? but she's not on the cover of my art history books. She's not featured. She's never been brought to the forefront, right? Um, Laura, what do you think about all this? Why, why should it matter? Where, where are we? Does it matter? Is it important? Yeah, it's, um, I, there are a couple things that come to mind. You know, one is, as I said, I, I really think that art history and history in general is about stories and we as human beings are wired for stories you know we look for patterns we look for something that makes sense and forever you know the narrative the story that's been told about the history of art um, started with Giorgio Vasari um, you know and so it did become a, um, a story about um, Florentine men, <laughs> and then it went on from there. Um, but, you know, the story sort of, the narrative sort of started there and then um, went forward. And, um, you know, I think that we still are trying to figure out what our stories are. And especially in the last, you know, couple of years when we've had such upheaval in our culture. And uh, we see it reflected in academia. I mean, we see, um, you know, 
people grasping for what, well, what's our story? Our story isn't really this monolithic narrative about these white guys from the past anymore. You know, that sort of, that basket has been spilled over. But I see in the art history classroom that we are struggling to figure out what our new story is, you know? And I think that it's really important for us as um, scholars, as students of art history to figure that out. Um, for students, I'm afraid that sometimes it's very um, chaotic and incoherent because we are in a time of transition right now where we are bringing in all of these new perspectives and that that monolithic narrative is, is no longer the same as it was uh, for good reason, um, but it is a little bit of a chaotic time just from trying to put together meaning, you know, for all of us. But I think that, um, you know, it's, uh, if the pandemic has showed us anything, it's showed us that art matters. I mean, what did we do as soon as we were all locked down last March? Everyone turned to books, to movies, to TV shows. We went to stories, we went to art. People missed going to the theater. They missed watching dance. They missed, you know, watching plays. Um, there's something that is fundamental and vital to us as human beings to watch and participate in art. And so um, I don't know how else to say it, but you know, I've been spending the last few years researching historical novels that are about the theft and recovery of art during World War II. And you know, you just constantly ask yourself, as I'm sure people did in the 1940s, you know, why are people risking their lives to save a work of art? It's just, you know, there's something there that we can't deny as human beings. And it matters now just as much as it did in any other era, I think. Okay, you said something really interesting, Laura, about what a chaotic time we're in. And we're in a moment of, of upheaval, right? For society, for art, for, for sort of the way we look at our own cultures, right? I mean, I, I, I was emailing you guys, uh, uh, with you guys about this last week. I feel like over the last year and a half, ever since George Floyd's murder, murder, suddenly white people are taking racism in this country more seriously. We're talking about it more. So is there an opportunity here to change the dynamic? I was thinking about, so the first museum I went to since the pandemic, right, this past summer, I went to Crystal Bridges uh, up in Northwest Arkansas, American art. And suddenly when I walked in, there were all of these images of Native American culture and Black artists and culture and all of these people of color and all of these women suddenly being centered in a way they were not. Is there an opportunity here to change the way we talk about all this? Bailey, I see you nodding, so I'll go with you. Oh, yes, I think absolutely there's an opportunity, but it's also something that we have to do out of necessity, I think, as good people generally, but also as good historians. I think that this is a time when we're asking you know, have we been telling the truth about history or have we been following in a tradition of people who were really attached to the ideals of their time and writing about art history in those ways? So I think, you know, as our ideals shift, we can realize that, you know, they were telling one version of art history, but it's maybe, in, in fact, it's, you know, it's likely not the historical reality in a lot of cases. You know, there were women artists, they just, you know, Vasari wrote about women artists, but we don't talk about the women artists that he wrote about. So I think that it's a time to ask really good historical questions as well as really good questions about our current systems. Jalen, you're doing a show right now where you're on YouTube where you do center contemporary artists of color, right? So have you seen a change over the last year and a half about how people are reacting to artists of color, contemporary artists of color? Have you seen things change? And is there a chance that maybe we are gonna talk about a more diverse group of artists moving forward? Uh, sure, it? absolutely. Um, I mean, I'm not mm, necessarily sure that like a huge shift has taken place maybe in American culture specifically uh, in terms of attitudes towards artists of color. Um, especially because this is not just an individual um, sort of shift in headspace. It's very much tied to the institutions which are in charge of curating culture for people. You know, um, I would say the average person 
uh, doesn't come into a museum or into even my channel with a whole bunch of knowledge about the history of, of art and you know those who are silenced and all of that kind of just beholden to what is put in front of you. <laughs> Um, and so I think some of these larger conversations um, have to be had in institutions that historically have not been very interested in these conversations. Um, and I know that's not necessarily individual curators' faults. Um, uh, for example, you know, in institutions I've worked in in the past, you're very much uh, just listening to a board of people who have a lot of money um, and a lot of hand in what is put on display. You know, if someone donates a bunch of um, uh, Renaissance paintings that are just portraits of you know white people and it's their friends and family, you know their ancestors or whatever. They've donated it and they say, "I want you to put this on display in the next show." So even if you had some big plan for uh, a show centering artists of color or something like that. I mean, they've given you money and they've given you their work. So now you have to put on their show. Um, it has nothing to do with uh, how well curated it is. It has nothing to do with uh, how it will benefit the community. It's just money <laughs> and museum politics, which is sometimes very disappointing, uh, but hopefully, shifts can be made towards um, less dependence on financial boards and um, donors and committees that have a lot of control but very little art historical knowledge so uh, I admire that idealism and optimism that we're going to get around money and and I fear we're not going to like that's like that like, like that's why your first comment about you know, I, I don't know that it really has changed that much. I agree. I, I think on the surface, people are talking about it, a, a, about race and inclusivity a little bit more. But down in the bones of it, I don't know if we've changed it so much yet. Um, Laura, complicated issues. How on earth can we start to change like the, the bones, the roots of this stuff when it's been so embedded in the way we've told art historical stories for thousands of years? I mean, it, it, is there a way to to change it so that the front covers of our books are not quite so male, white male dominated, Leonardo, Michelangelo, Raphael, Van Gogh? I think in academia, things are um, different. Uh, I really have seen over the last few years as I've followed academic conferences in art history, if you look at the programming, um, it is predominantly themes and topics around um, gender and race and class. I mean, these are huge topics in our discipline right now. And I also see it translate into the classroom. I see, um, you know, things that are um, really new and innovative being taught in the classroom, which I think is wonderful. I mean, I have a son in college who took a, um, it was not an art history class, it was a history class, but his professor was from the Caribbean and it was unlike anything I'm sure any of us ever took in college. I mean, it really was a completely different, um, you know, history of, of the world class that I've ever seen. So I think there's some really innovative things happening in academia. Um, as I mentioned though, I hear from students, current students and also, um, older students going back to school that for them it's a little disorienting because it's so different than what they've what they've learned in the past or it wasn't what they were expecting or they don't know what the story is anymore and so I think it's I, I really do feel like we're in a time of transition and I think to try to answer your question Stephanie I definitely think it's an opportunity to reset the different stories that we're that we're telling at least um within the within the the walls of academia and you know i um jumped off the the academic train some years ago and i now teach art history online and i write historical fiction and i think there too you know those of us who are telling stories in other ways have opportunities to um to change that as well for sure i mean these topics are also 
very uh, vibrant and alive in the, um, in the historical novel society and the other writers conferences that I go to, there's a lot of discussion of these same themes and topics. And so I, I definitely think it's a, an important moment. Is it going to change from the educational level? Do you guys see changes in what, Jalen, you're in an art history program. Bailey, why don't we start with you, since you're not really in an art history program, you were talking about queer feminism and medieval performance art. Are you seeing a difference in the class offerings? And maybe that'll help art history change as it comes up from, you know what I'm saying? Like if it comes up from the university level, comes up from the PhDs, what are you say, seeing, Bailey? I mean, I think the fun part is that those are things that I'm doing in an art history program. So, you know, it's, it's not just about, and I think this goes back to what Jalen was saying as well about the problems of sort of navigating these things in a capitalist society and a society with our current values. It's not that we can just add people into the canon and be like, oh, here's a person of color and this person was probably gay. You know, it can be a really, a deeper look at our, our values, you know? So the Lesbian History Archive in New York is totally funded on individual donations. So they don't have the problem of people saying, you know, you can only represent this type of person. Instead, they get to really put their community first. And I think, you know, for me, I'm using queer and femme theory and art history to sort of take out masculinist values. And so I think, you know, those, it's that the deeper value shift that's happening right now that I think is really, I feel really excited about. And I think it can happen, but it does need to be at that structural level. Like where's the money going and what are we allowed to say at conferences, you know? Um, so Jalen, you're in art history. Are you seeing a change? I mean, I mean, it, it's hard to compare when you haven't been in a PhD program before, but are you seeing more diversity taught at sort of in your classes that are preparing you to go out and work in the art history world? Sure, absolutely. Um, I'm taking some courses related to um, the history of protest art um, or art created during different uprisings. Um, I'm also taking a course uh, related to the 70s and different artists creating during that time. Um, I don't think this is necessarily universal. It has much more to do with the professors at my university and their specialties, um, which was a huge part of my selecting uh, my school. Whereas if I had went to another school and there were, you know, medi medievalist specialist and Renaissance specialist, I'm sure I would not have had the same experience. Um, oh, I didn't mean to say that those people aren't capable of um, exploring uh, non-Eurocentric, non-white topics. It just um, a lot of my experience in undergrad or speaking to other art history undergrads was um, a very siloed um, sort of lens of art history, very much in the same spirit of what you mentioned earlier. Um, you know, you say, oh, we're gonna be looking at the art history canon. It's kind of like, it's not really a canon, is it? If it's the same artist over and over again and they're all from the same area, so, you know. Um, so, uh, uh, Bailey, you said something about, you know, trying to demasculinize art history. We are all four women sitting around here and having this conversation about a, a history of art that traditionally has been art, male art historians telling stories about art made by men for men. It, it, I mean, it, it gets these like levels of men about men about men. And I, I know I'm often asked, uh, because my first two novels did center around old white men, right? They just did. And part of it's because I was raised on that canon of art history, right? So I was raised on this idea that that's the great art. And uh, for the first time, I felt like I was able as a 21st century American woman to be able to put my own perspective on the art history that has um, dominated so much of our visual life as, a, as an entire culture. And I got to be able to tell that story. So I just by me telling it, I got to change the perspective on it. How do you guys navigate being women, particularly navigating this world that has traditionally been dominated by men? And I do think that's changing. I know it's changing. 
Um, Bailey, clearly you're trying to like overturn it and go get out. Let's, let's, let, 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 let's reset the stage. So why don't you start and then I'll go to Laura and then Jalen. Sure. I think that it's a layered thing, maybe especially in disciplines like art history where, you know, traditionally it was all men. And now, you know, we actually have a lot of women in art history and um, not just women, but feminine presenting folks in art history. And I think that, you know, because of that, art history has become less valued in our society. So, you know, for me, it's, I, I think a lot about sort of, um, and I'm, I'm thinking more about sort of queer femininity. So um, women and um, non-binary folks as well who present in a feminine way, you know, how do we value their values, you know, like vulnerability or different methods of doing research that aren't so much about um, production, but maybe more about reflection, you know, things like I think that those deeper shifts are really important because, you know, women are showing up and we're amazing. I have some, I've come from the University of Victoria and we have some incredible, you know, powerhouse women. I've um, been so privileged to study with them. And so I think now it's about the deeper shift of how do we value them properly? They're here, they're showing up, you know, how do we value that instead of disregarding it now that it's more women than men, maybe. Laura, how do you deal with this? Because like you do write about, like some of your protagonists are men, like you've written from the, the POV of Leonardo, just like I have, but you also weave in voices of women. How do you navigate this as someone trying to fictionalize this, this grand old history that we have? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And, you know, a few years ago, um, if someone asked me, had asked me this question, I would have just said, it's a novel, it's a made up story, <laughs> you know, so what, what else is there? But, you know, that's not really true. I mean, and, you know, certainly in the last few years, I have really stopped to question what, you know, what I am talking about, you know, even in a completely made up story. And, you know, I have written in the, from the perspective of a fictional 20 something Venetian man living in, you know, the turn of the 16th century, you know, and meanwhile, here I am a middle-aged woman living in America in the 21st century. And so, you know, it's interesting. I think in historical fiction also, we've seen much more of a trend toward, um, you know, own voices and people writing from the perspective of people that represent uh, the same type of person that they are. Does that mean that we are not allowed or can't write, um, you know, someone different than us? Um, it's, it's a question that I see coming up a lot in uh, the historical fiction community. <clears throat> I have written black characters. I have um, written gay characters. I have written men. I have written women. And, um, you know, it's, I think about these things all the time because you certainly, I have never met a historical novelist who didn't really try their best to try to get it right, you know, to really do their research, to really reach out um, to people who they are trying to represent in their books and really try to get it right. I think we do. Um, you know, I, I think we also get it wrong a lot of the time too, <laughs> but it's definitely an interesting thing, not only for art history, but also for historical fiction as well. Jalen, what about you? How do you navigate particularly the, 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 the being a woman part? I haven't found a lot of issue with it. I find a lot of my coworkers in museums to be uh, like majority women. Um, a lot of academics in art history are mostly women. Um, so from that perspective, no issues. Um, but from the perspective of working or talking about artists and sort of always landing on these conversations about male artists, um, I did, you know, I was writing my thesis um, and I realized it's sort of a study of three artists and all of them were male. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I've, been, I've perpetuated the issue. I've been caught. Um, but what I did um, to sort of combat that was I 
created a conversation between their art and other artists, um, most of which were women, um, especially because I was focusing on sort of a specific uh, conceptual idea that they're all exploring in their work. And I'm like, obviously it's not only men who are doing this, but why did I select three men? <laughs> um, uh, so yes, I ended up paralleling and creating a dialogue between these three men and several other women. Um, but yes, I, I fell into the trap and I didn't even notice until my advisor pointed it out. So, you know. It's so easy to do, isn't it? Like that's the shocking thing about art history is it's so easy to fall into that well. However, it gives me faith that you feel like you haven't faced um, uh, the issue in like life that so many women and in museums and professors and people studying art history are women. I, I think that's a heartening change. However, Bailey, you said something it was really interesting earlier because I've thought about this. You said, um, but is it making art history, like is it devaluing in, in the broader culture art history in some way? Like as though the, now that it's become women's work, it's, it's important, right? And I have literally, I, I've had these conversations. I have stayed awake at night um, thinking about that and, and, and like worrying about that and, and not wanting to now write, be women writing about women artists making art for women. Like, I don't wanna perpetuate that well either. So I'm actually heartened that Jalen ended up writing about a, a, a few men, even though that perpetuated a problem and we gotta solve that. Um, because I think there is this weird line. Uh, you brought it up, Bailey. What are your thoughts on that? Because I think it's fascinating and I think it's something no one talks about. Yeah, I think that it is, it is a reality in our society. I think that when women or people who are more feminine say something it just has less weight you know it's given less weight we're sort of we're asked is that real you know i've had a lot of people you know you're making it up you know um and so i think that you know based on different intersections of privilege obviously you know certain people just have to do more work to be taken seriously and i think that as a woman and an art historian um and i don't know maybe sometimes as someone who's also um, gay and feminine presenting, you know, I am, I do find sometimes I'm taken less seriously. And I think that that's, that's a real problem. You know, should I have to say it, with, you know, more loudly, or is it, can I just say it softly and you take it just the same way, you, you know? Right. I, it, it, it's such a complicated issue. And it's hard to talk about too. Like, I'm sort of always like, un like uncomfortable talking about like, am I supposed to be saying this stuff out loud? Laura, you and I are very similar in age. So we have been through sort of the same trajectory of history on this. Have you thought about it? Have you worried about it? I have, I have to be really frank. I have worried about it in like the realm of historical fiction. I have some male fans, but so much of historical fiction is women writing about women for women. Have you, has this hit you? Has this struck you? What do you think? Yeah, it is. It's really, um... Like I said, I think very carefully now about, um, you know, who my characters are, what the point of view is, and um, yeah, for sure, I agree. It's, uh, it's definitely complicated, and, um, you know, I think we really have to be paying attention to um, how we're talking about it and how we're making choices, and I love, um, Jalen, that you um, realized what you know that you had chosen three men and then you went out and chose some other women to make sure that there was a real dialogue there and i'm sure it really enriched your project in the end and so i think that's the thing i mean we have to have a diversity of um of voices and you know even within historical fiction you know there's this concept of quote unquote women's fiction which i always thought was kind of kind of humorous <laughs> But, you know, it's that idea, like you said, Stephanie, of women writing about women for women, but certainly that there aren't any male, you know, it's not that there are not any male characters in the books, but, but definitely, you know, and I will say that women's fiction is one of the hugest selling, you know, genres in fiction. So it's not like it's been marginalized. Certainly no one could ever say that romance has been marginalized because, you know, the romance novels sell, you know, like hotcakes more than any other genre. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's something that I, I think we all have to make sure that we are um, thinking about a diversity of characters in our books, a diversity of, of voices for sure. 
so my question is, what can we do moving forward? What are you trying to do? Jalen, you changed your, your thesis, right? To add some women in. You're out trying to highlight uh, artists of color on your YouTube channel. But what can people at home who are watching, who are tuning in, who aren't maybe art historians, who aren't maybe working in the museum field, do to help promote changes that are gonna make art history more inclusive broadly? What can people, just regular people who are, who are gonna watch this later on YouTube, what can they do to help, to help all of this continue to grow in the right direction, to continue to get more diverse and more exciting for everybody to engage with? Jalen. Um, I would say, I mean, if you know any artists, if your friends are artists, ask them about their work, buy their work if you can, um, like their, um, or for contemporary artists that are alive, you know, um, like their Instagram posts, you know, even if you can't spend like $500 on a painting, you can tell other people about it. And then maybe they know somebody who has $500 and wants a painting. <laughs> Um, these are like very small but tangible important things for artists. I think it can be very hard to break into um, the art world, if you will. It's a very mysterious and very money driven, very clout driven space. Um, so I think just sharing art, telling other people about any good exhibitions you've seen, is something you can do that's not necessarily, um, you know, a great burden on you. Bailey, what else? Do you have any other thoughts about how people at home can engage to forward this conversation in some way? Uh, that people should give themselves the credit to think critically about things that they're encountering. If you go over to a friend's house and they have an art history coffee table book with Gauguin on the cover, you know, ask some questions about that. You know, you don't have to be an art historian to sort of stop taking things at face value. But then similar to Jalen's point as well, just, you know, if there are artists doing uh, good work, pay them for it. But also if there are resources like community gallery spaces that are doing good things, support them. And I think as well, just seek out open access resources that are increasingly, I hope, available to sort of learn about art history beyond the canon that uh, everybody talks about. Laura, from your perspective, any any thoughts to add on how we can all, all of us get further this conversation along? Yeah, I mean, I think it can be really simple. I think, you know, if you're sitting at home right now, go on Instagram, go on YouTube and follow like somebody new that, you know, you didn't know before who's um, maybe got a different perspective on art history. I mean, that's a very simple thing that we can do to start to see different things in our news feed, you know, and, and explore different things in our news feed. Go out and pick up a book by an author that you've never read before. I just um, picked up Home Going, uh, and I, I just had to double check the name of the author because I knew I was going to butcher it, but it's um, Ya Gyasi. It's not a specifically art related novel, but um, it is a it really gives you a great perspective on systemic racism and it's a great book i'm really enjoying it right now and so um you know i would say just pick up a book follow an instagram account you know watch something different than you've watched in the past make an effort to make sure it's you know something from a different perspective than you're familiar with i think those little things really add up over time so i actually want to get everybody's opinion here not on what people at home can do but what people in the art history world can do, because I think that's where you're talking about professors, you're talking about museum professionals, you're talking about artists, you're talking about everybody who is involved in the, in the art world. What can, uh, what can we do? We're all in the art world. Two of you are getting your PhD. Two of us are writing art historical novels. What can we do to help um, level the playing field just a little bit, just to start making it, going back to history and saying, these artists are important, let's talk about them. Let's not just center Michelangelo every single time, although I do happen to be obsessed. So that one's a hard one for me to swallow. Um, what can we do as, muse as art people and people actually working in the industry and what can people broadly work in the industry do? Laura, this time I'll start with you, throwing you on the hot seat first. 
Yeah, I think, you know, like I said, in academia, I think people are already, you know, turning over the apple cart there and bringing lots of new perspectives to academia. Um, in museums, I would challenge museum professionals to rethink the blockbuster exhibition um, because, you know, we see these blockbuster exhibitions that bring in lots and lots of funds and very often they are, um, well, you know, perfect example, the Met just put on the, uh, the Medici portraits, which is a fantastic exhibit and I'm, I'm not picking on the Met at all, but, you know, there are um, blockbuster exhibitions just sort of lurking in the wings of, of museum collections around our around America and not in any case. So I, I think, you know, some some new and different uh, exhibitions that might shake things up would really help uh, bring change things not only in the art world, but also like you said, Stephanie, bring it to people who are not art historians and not necessarily specialists in this area. Jalen, any any tips or advice or insight to the uh, to the actual powers that be at art, in the art world of how to change this? Uh, listen to the communities that you exist in. Um, I know a lot of museums are in these huge cities, but they're often very diverse cities, and so you know even if the majority of your visitors happen to be um, educated white people, maybe there's a reason for that. Maybe there's issues with your programming or with your exhibitions as to why a specific marginalized groups are not interested in coming to your space. Um, I would say leave room open for um, conversations with community members. Bailey, what about you? What can the, the, the art, the official art like I said, powers that be do to, to start to even the playing field. Yeah, I think you know if you're lucky enough to be a power that be you know with money, I think it's about being careful where you put it. You know, um, curate the exhibitions you know um, that are of interest to your community, like Jalen said, and also you know hire the people um, that need to be hired. You know, like think about who's in your department and what voices aren't there. And, but I think, you know, as well, you know, even if you're an underpaid art history professor and you don't have the money, I think it is, it, I think that a lot of power comes from getting in front of a lecture hall and just saying it, saying what needs to be said and what your students need to hear. You know, you don't have to repeat the same story over and over again. You can stand there and tell them something different that's just as, you know, legitimate and academic. And um, yeah, I think I just would, I just want to add, you know, that, um, Casey Hoke is the one who designed queer art history and I've just sort of taken it on. And so, you know, I think Casey was a young activist living in Louisville and he saw this gap, you know, he wasn't seeing representation for the queer community. And so he made this archive with his skills and knowledge. And so, you know, it was the only thing that came up when I Googled queer art history when I was starting my master's. And I, so I think that putting those things out into the universe, it has a lot of impact. So I would encourage people to, just do that, you know, put it out there and say it. So uh, thank you all for joining me. Um, thank you all for the work you do in art and art history and helping to uh, art and color on YouTube. It's fantastic. If, if you wanna be introduced to a contemporary artists of color, Jalen's show on YouTube is a must, must, must subscribe. Um, Bailey, your work, your continued work at Queer art history is phenomenal and, and that site is phenomenal and I think has raised so much awareness and um, is so important to the continuing conversation. And Laura, you know I love your books and you know everybody at home, I think they should all read your books because they are such a way to enter into art history through your imagination, um, uh, which is what Laura and I both do. We write fiction and we go, hey, come on over, play in the art history game. Maybe it's not quite so scary. Story time, Stephanie, story time.